Well, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Harry Brailsford here coming to you live from downtown Seattle on the 41st floor of what used to be called the old Sea First Bank building. Kids won't get that. But it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Let me go into presenter mode. Hold on, folks. And here we go. It's the MSP Tech Talk Series, uh, winter quarter 2018. This is the second lecture of six. So we have six weekly lectures. And this is one that's near and dear to my heart. We'll, we'll talk about that in just a moment. But today we're talking about five uh, analytical tools that MSPs probably already own and can use immediately. A little bit of housekeeping, use the questions feature for asking your questions. Jenny will recite those as they uh, they roll in. Jenny, that's fine, but go ahead and interrupt us. Next week, we have HIPAA. And next week, the webinar is on Friday the 2nd, which is kind of cool because that, well, it's actually not cool. It would normally be Blue Friday in Seattle because Seattle would be in the Super Bowl, so that would be like a holiday here in Seattle. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're we're not in the Super Bowl, but nonetheless, uh, that is Super Bowl weekend. Let's jump right into it. Once again, five steps to implementing analytics in an MSP practice. A couple of introductions. Uh, myself, for those of you that I have not met, my name is Harry Brailsford. I'm the founder of SMB Nation, a community publisher, and a by the end of this webinar, you'll understand that we'd prefer to be thought of as an analytics firm. Uh, ho hopefully, if I do my job, you'll think and know about what SMB Nation is as a community. Um, and, and I guess I feel I'm, I'm qualified to have this conversation with you that I uh, recently exited a big data startup in downtown Seattle in the predictive analytics area. i to talk about that. Um, I'm joined by John Spilker uh, in particular, uh, Bob Nitrio. We'll talk with at midpoint, but John Spilker is from uh, the good old Microsoft days. John, say hello, maybe the fastest introduction in sports, if you don't mind, your background, and what are you doing now, my friend? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm owner of 425 Digital in the Seattle area, and we help um, mainly technology partners such as Sage, Intact, um, NetSuite, build up a greater web presence through SEO, SEM, and social campaigns. And as you just mentioned, I'm a former Microsoft employee. I was there for some 16 years, um, managed several websites, including Microsoft in government, as well as the small business support site, which is where I believe we met formally. Correct, thank you, John. And John, I'm going to be calling calling on you as, as we go through this. And feel free to interject. Um, I'll be so here. Folks the, so, folks, to set the table, uh, a couple of things about analytics. First of all, easy is is hard. Analytics is is a rabbit hole, and you have to fight every single day. And I had to do this in the startup, but you have to fight every day to make things simple. Um, it's very easy to make it complex. It's very hard to make it simple. Second thing is the data will tell us. We are constantly amazed uh, with some of the uh, analytical tools we use, use by the uh, results that we get. So for example, um, a little over a year ago, we put out a survey about how many of you interact with state and local government. And I, my tummy told me 10%. The results came in 40% solid uh, with, with real engagement and then 70% have a touch in that sector. So I, I, I was blown away. Um, third item, math is our friend. And, and you're talking to the guy when I raced for Montana State as a freshman in college, I had to go to remedial math with, uh, uh, I, I, I was so bad. I was so bad coming out of the alternative high school system that I, I basically had to start over in math in college. And then, you know, now, now I are a math it's, it's kind of funny that that came full circle. But the point I'm really trying to make, guys, is content is, you know, here yesterday, here today, and here tomorrow. God bless content. No one, I wrote all the books. I get content. But I'd, I'd like you to take um, walk away from today thinking math is our friend. And then finally, this is a thinking person's game. And, and you guys have the chops. Uh, you know, it's, 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 
boy, we'll, we'll kind of key in on that. I mean, you don't necessarily need a master's or a PhD or all that, but it's, it's definitely a different motion than break fix. But, you know, you guys have MBAs in life, owning, operating, and running your own MSP practices. So you got the chops. Um, but it is a different motion. And, 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 and quite frankly, a lot of people get turned on by it, and I'll just leave it at that. Let's go to the next slide, please. The agenda. So we're going to talk about five cool tools. I got a bonus. We're going to talk about SurveyMonkey, LinkedIn, go to Webinar, MailChimp, Hootsuite, and then Forms. And then also maybe a seventh bonus is having John on the call. Um, and John, I'll, I'll look to you to kind of talk about web presence. Uh, it's not an area of expertise for me, SEO and so on. It is for you. So we're going to call that the, uh, the seventh cool tool. Um, Folks, uh, tip of the hat to Fortinet. So Fortinet is a now a long-time community sponsor of SMB Nation. And as Jeff Middleton used to say, and uh, boy, Bob Nitrio, do you realize that was that was over 10, that's 11 years ago that we did the 07 event in uh, New Orleans. That was a long time ago. Um, it, it, it was, my friend. And Bob, I'm, I'm not ignoring you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you introduce yourself in just a little bit, but that's 11 years ago. And, Jeff Middleton used to famously say, because his, his uh, conferences on the swing migration and other topics were academic in nature, and he used to make the vendors behave. That, that was his famous line, is that they're locked up in a room and they're going to behave. And, and I would offer Fortinet in a kind of way resembles that, that we have worked hand in hand with them to integrate into the community as a, as a partner, not lording over MSPs taking feedback. Bob, you were, in fact, let's have you introduce yourself now, my friend, because you were in the focus group in mid-December in Sunnyvale with Fortinet. First of all, how, how did you think Fortinet behaved in that focus group? And second of all, please introduce yourself and we'll continue. Oh, I think that they uh, behaved very splendidly. I think that they made a very good point that they're trying to extend their reach into the SMB space, where some people have felt that Fortinet was too big to play, but that is not the truth, obviously. Um, I myself have been an IT consultant uh, to small businesses for 25 years. And uh, just because I'm going to be relocating my family, um, I am actually exiting the computer and network um, daily management business. But I am at this point also very deeply embedded with mobile apps as a service. And I'll be focusing on that and a few other point solutions going forward, as well as still doing consulting work. But day-to-day -day management of computers and networks is now in my rearview mirror. Well, and I'll summarize it like this, my friend, is that you are kind of in, in, in embody the uh, ENIP book, the popular book by Gerber. Sir, you were the pie maker. And now you're <laughs> elevating up to strategic. And, and that great book, Bob, I saw someone checking that book out at the Bainbridge Island Library the other day, and I, I had a little sigh. He, he didn't know what it was. And I said, hang on fast. It's going to change your life. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. I mean, it's one of the books that everybody in this industry should read uh, if they want to be a good consultant and if they want to succeed. I, it's yeah. just a great book. Let's jump right into it. And John, Please uh, speak up as you're able here. I'll set the table. So this world is scary. So this is a loom escape of basically uh, analytics viewed primarily from a social point of view. But, you know, everybody's seen these charts. And they're meant to overwhelm and daze and amaze. And so what you have here is every possible conceivable toolkit. Um, folks, you're going to get the deck. So, you know, you, you, you can expand that graphic. But... Boy, howdy. Uh, social listening. You, you, you got rabbit ears. You got blab. Or it, 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 it's, it's overwhelming. And so what we've tried to do at SMB Nation is uh, best of breed. Um, so we have looked at tools that we use as a publisher and have over, you know, well over a decade of experience and expertise with. And tools we know, trust, and they're going to be here tomorrow. There are hundreds of tools. And, and John, I want to pose the question for you as we look at this scary, overwhelming chart. Um, 
talk talk to us a little bit about web and SEO and some of the tools there, and and maybe one quick example of how you might help an MSP drive traffic to their website. Sure, I think my world is a little bit simpler um, than what you have here. Basically, I live in about three or four tools, um, just about 90% of the time. Um, despite the fact that I'm a former Microsoft employee, I live in a very Google-centric world uh, because of Google search. And they are by far the dominant search engine as well as advertising platform. So we kind of have to go where the eyeballs are. Um, in terms of in terms of um, SEO and search engine marketing, I really view the one, the two of them as almost one and the same thing. You need to do both. Um, as search engine marketing produces immediate results, and there the major tool is AdWords. And AdWords is somewhat complicated, although there's uh, Google does have a more simplified version of it. The concepts aren't hard, that's for certain. You pick keywords, you write headlines, and you point to pages. Uh, what is the benefit of search engine marketing is the results are almost instantaneous. Whereas SEO, SEO is the preferred place to be in the long run, but it takes quite a while to get there. Um, typically, an SE, SEO improvements take a minimum of two months to happen, uh, but often much longer than that. Whereas SEM tells us immediately, are we targeting the right keywords? Do we have the right headlines? Um, and also Google tells us whether the content is good or not. Google wants people clicking to those ads, so they actually give you a lot more information. Um, Google AdWords also has a tool called Keyword Finder, which isn't bad and really helps you narrow what should I be looking for. There are better tools on the market. One of them is SEM Rush. It is not cheap. It's about a thousand a year uh, to license it. The benefit of it is that it lets you know what your competitors are doing what keywords they appear to be targeting and get traffic for. Plus it gives you ranking of domains and um, it's a rather simple tool to use, but there again, it's not cheap. Then the other thing that is really part of our whole toolbox is Google Analytics. And there are there are competitors such as Web Trends, which is excellent, Adobe's Omniture, which is kind of the Cadillac of web analytics. Both of those tend to be a little on the pricier side. Google Analytics is free. And I think Google Analytics very much connects to the world that you're talking about. How much traffic are we getting? Where is it coming from? What are they doing? Uh, we spend a lot of time in analytics trying to set up conversions and success events to really figure out what is working, what is driving towards um, the end goals that we're uh, trying to achieve. And then there's another tool called Data Studio, which allows us to build much uh, slicker, easier to understand dashboards, doesn't have too high of a learning curve, and it integrates directly with all of Google's tools. So in a... There we go, my friend. Or go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah go yeah, ahead. That, shell it, and then we'll in a on. nutshell, that's, that's the world that um, web site managers tend to live in. And, and, and John, what we'll do, uh, and again, I'm going to call out to you on a couple of other points like Hootsuite, but what we're going to do is, uh, Jenny, if you could make a note, let's bring John back. You know, I'm thinking summer quarter, you know, and everybody kind of has their sandals on, John, and, and <laughs> I always loved summer quarter as a college student because it was so mellow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Harry, be before we move on, we had a question. Can, can you please say that tool, again, was it SEO Rush? SEM, uh, 
search engine marketing and then rush all one word i believe it's a uk company cool and jenny can you confirm you see my screen i think i fumble fingered my mouse for half a second there nope we can see it okay so folks uh let me just uh okay we're back so we're one percent of the way there and this is uh um, an example of SurveyMonkey, which is your friend, and I'm going to talk about that, so that's one of our tools. But more importantly, um, the IBM Partner Conference, Partner World Conference, um, which is wrapped up with one of their other conferences this year in March in Vegas, and I'm happy to get you guys that information if you want to live in that world, but relevant to this conversation is IBM has a decade head start in many cases over some other uh, ISVs. And, and, and I would offer they've got a, I don't know about a decade, but I, I feel they have a little bit of a head start, for example, over Microsoft itself in the analytics game because of Watson. And, you know, that's why they bought the weather. Watson's really cool. You, you actually should look at it. They bought the Weather Channel um, primarily to get the data from the Weather Channel, so they could train Watson. That was the basis of that acquisition. But they're they're doing some really cool stuff. And at their conference last year, um, I, I always say Jenna Romney, but J Janita Romney, uh, the CEO, um, talked about in their keynote that we're just one percent of the way there. And loosely translated, you know where we're at with analytics and and uh, BI and AI and all that stuff. Um, is the five and a quarter inch floppy disk. And hang on fast because this could, area could carry you for, for the balance of your career if you're uh, part of our standard demographic of late 40s um, at SMB Nation. This, this could be it. Uh, there, I mean, there's other sectors. There's security. There's other sectors, of course. And you don't want to spend all your time in just any one niche, but but this could be part of the mix because we're just starting out. Now, here's what's interesting with SurveyMonkey is, again, we're constantly amazed. We did a survey um, about uh, our um, uh, a service that, uh, that, that we have on the shelf uh, called Pivot in terms of helping MSPs with marketing as a service. Happy to talk offline with you about that. But we sent out... Um, and, and John, you'll, you'll, you'll like these numbers. So 60,000 emails out to our base, resulting in 566 visitors and only five registrations for this very topic. And it became a joke at SMB Nation that, you know, you're that guy at the neighborhood Christmas party that's selling uh, financial planning and life insurance, right? You're, you're that guy over in the corner that uh, your neighbor, they don't want to talk to you. Um, and and, and, and the, the humor here is that this is new for a lot of us. It's uncomfortable for a lot of us. Now, now I would argue conferences and workshops and webinars should make you feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, but this just shows the green field that, that you know, we're going to hang in there and, and, and keep on this journey with you. And, and quite frankly, John, we're going to look brilliant. In about three, four, five years, we're, we're going to look brilliant. And they're going to say, wow, you got in so early. Yes. Um, John, any, any, yeah, any thoughts on the adoption trends of the, both my world and your world and, and, and small business, quite frankly? Well, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you talk about 60,000 only resulting in 566 visits and five registrations, I think we're seeing this right across the board that getting people to our final target is not easy and is getting progressively harder. I would have dared say that if you'd done that 10 years ago, your numbers would have looked hugely different but we're all ending up with so much stuff in our inboxes, as well as we're hit with banner ads all the time. It's just gonna get progressively harder. And it's also gonna mean that we need to be much more clever and much more innovative in giving people a reason to do these things, to complete a survey, visit a page, or do some sort of interaction. 
Yep, yep, yep. And and just to check up on the slide is it's hard to read, folks, but the the center where the largest response was was you were interested in conversations surrounding Office 365. You were interested in mo knowing more about Azure and also security. Uh, win 10 and money makers, but analytics at the very bottom was uh, a distant last place. Hey, Harry. So let's talk about some. Yeah, Jenny. If you get a chance, can you speak up just a little bit louder? One of the attendees is having a hard time hearing you, but can hear John just fine. Wow. Well, I've never been accused of. <laughs> That's what they said. They'd never known you to not speak up or be able to understand you, but they can't understand you today. But yeah, people, my sister leads the parade that I talk to loudly, but thank you, Jenny. I, I will do so. So folks, LinkedIn. Um, and here, a couple quick hitters on LinkedIn. We all do it. We all don't take advantage of it as well as we should. With the Microsoft acquisition, I'm seeing a lot more innovation. And I would offer, go ahead and, and kick up to LinkedIn Premium. Uh, if you pay annually, I think it's about 800 bucks. But, but do it. Throw some money at LinkedIn and get the cool tools like Sales Navigator. There's some YouTube videos on how to use it. But at the end of the day, um, what I'm after with LinkedIn is lookalikes or what we call nearest next door neighbor in a big data scenario. So if, if you look at my profile and then you look to the side you're going to see people who are in my realm. So, for example, we'll pick on Carl Palachek, but let's pretend that Harry Brelsford is a customer. Oh, in fact, here's my favorite example is Joe Axney in Denver, Colorado, whose niche is veterinarians and craft breweries. So that, 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 that guy is kind of... It's kind of cool, and he calls uh, his niche in the veterinarian practice as an MSP is healthcare without humans, and 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 what people will spend on their animals. So it's a lucrative niche as well as the alcohol. But um, imagine I'm a veterinarian, and what do you think is going to happen when you go to link my LinkedIn profile? You're probably going to see other veterinarians or closely related industries. You're going to see lookalikes. And so we're going to pretend that Carl Palachek is a veterinarian. Um, now, I'm giving you a very simplistic view of the lookalike concept. And, and by the way, you can do this. You, you can do this this afternoon. Um, spend a lot of time in LinkedIn. It's, it's, a, it's free. B, you get a lot more if you do the premium spin. But this is what we do in predictive analytics and big data as we go for lookalikes. Now, we use a lot more math and uh, a data warehouse I worked with called Versium will take it to a whole other level and, 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 and return 6 million IP addresses for machine targeting for potential online MBA students, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but um, that's, that's a cool tool is to view LinkedIn as your tool for lookalikes. Closely related is the LinkedIn uh, SSI, or the Social Selling Index. And so go ahead and Google that, as it were, and find out what your score is, okay? And it's a little bit of gamification, so that's cool. To, you know, you want to you get up to that next chili pepper, like if you were at Spiceworks. Um, and, and so uh, it's free. So go ahead and score yourself. More importantly, if you think you want to start introducing this kind of business service to your customers. So you're Mr. and Mrs. MSP, and you want to introduce some of these tools to your small business customers. And, and, and John, I'm going to have you give an example of that with some clients you work with, but this is something you can do with the founder of an SMB, and more importantly, their, their salesperson, and understand how can they better exploit LinkedIn. This is measuring how you use LinkedIn. Um, John, you and I have had some discussions, and I believe you have a client where this kind of fits that model. You have an MSP client, they have a niche, and they're trying to go and offer more expanded services to their uh, SMB clients. Do, do you want to, is, is you're able, do you want to kind of share that storytelling? Yeah, um, we actually we have a couple uh, who fit um, who fit that bill. LinkedIn 
is becoming, I would say, the single most important um, tool in in trying to drive awareness as well as to giving a website validation. So there's a there's it's there's a fair bit of controversy about does Google look at LinkedIn data to see um, to judge um, and score a website. I think what we found in the past is that the more people that you send from LinkedIn to your website, you will start to do a lot better, especially in SEO. So there's a huge interaction between that. Plus, it's also a great thing of you're building up greater validity for your website. That's um, that's extremely important. So what we where we find where people seem to go wrong with LinkedIn is they put the greatest emphasis on their personal profile and not their company profile. So let's say that you have five employees. You want all five employees to link to your company profile, which then links to your website. If you do announcements, you do it from the company profile and you and your five employees um, like and share that announcement in uh, to your own constituency in LinkedIn. So it takes a little bit of forethought, but it's I would say it's becoming one of the most critical things now. Yeah, and that's why I'm I'm suggesting if you're going to invest in analytics. Investment number one, in my opinion, would be the premium services of LinkedIn and Master Sales Navigator. Folks, it's only getting better, is Microsoft. And that's a whole other webinar. John, yes. we, you and I could go on for an hour about the integration points and the yes. analytics. Uh, not, not today, but <laughs> it's only getting better, folks. We're going to move on. Uh, the webinar analytics of Go to Webinar. And so, GoToWebinar is surprisingly strong. We're using it today. And you should be using it for your lunch and learns, for whatever your outreach is, your digital workshop outreach is, um, or maybe a hybrid version. We've done that too, where you have an in-person group and you have GoToWebinar running for the, uh, for the remote group. Mm -hmm. But we can measure a lot. And the way to interpret these analytics is, well, a couple ways. One is we're, we're well, let me go to the next slide. It's easier to explain. Go to webinar has lead score. They have an algorithm, and it's shown in the attendee report after the webinar, not, not, the, uh, not the registration report, which would be pre-acquisition, but post-acquisition or post-webinar would be the attendee report. And column three or column C is interest level. And the interest level is an algorithm, and it has a half a dozen coefficients. And so it's measuring a few things. And this is where you really, really want to think it through. So it's going to measure, so first of all, did you attend? Um, second, did you answer the sign-up survey questions? Uh, next, did you answer the poll questions? Jenny, do we have a poll today? Forgive me. Do we have a poll? We do. Okay. Okay, perfect. So we have a poll. It's going to measure uh, focus on screen one. Um, so, you know, people tend to check emails if the webinar is not going great. Present company accepted. And, uh, and then um, the follow-up uh, questions. And so from that, we can derive a score. And I feel it's predictive. What, what, what I like to do is say if it's over 50, those people get a call or a follow-up right away. If it's under 50, you know, we never ignore a lead in this business. We're not, we're not overwhelmed with leads, but you can certainly prioritize it. And under 50, you know, slap them into MailChimp or HubSpot, nurture them, uh, get, get a follow-up call to the potential customer at a future date. But this is where you can set yourself apart. And again, more importantly, you can provide this service for your clients. So you can start to change the nature of your MSP practice from infrastructure and break fix and so on. So I'm going to move on, and we're going to talk about MailChimp. 
And uh, John, I, I bet you're chomping at the bit. You'll, you'll, you'll have some insights on this with AB. But what we do um, is everything we send out in MailChimp, right? A common tool. Uh, this is all open architecture. And that's a really big deal to me that it's not a proprietary system. We've all worked with those where you can't get your data out unless they pay a king's ransom, and it makes it a real hoo-ha to migrate. Um, so these are friendly open architecture tools, and MailChimp is investing in analytics increasingly. The simple version is an A-B test, and so this last Sunday was my Sunday paper, and I had what I would call a, uh, a, a, a conservative headline, and then I had a more liberal headline. The more liberal headline said she's back, and it's uh, Dianca has now um, secure, re-secured the sponsor of GoDaddy for her two, her final two car races. And so, and, and not surprisingly, that won the election overwhelmingly. And the way an AB test works in MailChimp is typically they send out to half the audience with A and B, two different headlines. And again, I'd offer make them a little radically different so you can start to learn your audience. And um, it's typically a four-hour voting period, and then the winner uh, of the election becomes the headline for the remaining 50% of your list. So, John, my question to you, maybe this kind of goes back to your Microsoft days when you know you were involved in the small business support website and some content and all that. Um, Give give another explanation of A-B testing from your reality to compound what I just offered. Um, yeah, actually, you were incredibly far ahead of the curve, Harry. Um, I don't have any clients who are doing A-B testing like you are. Now, at Microsoft, everything that we did was A, B, C, whatever tested and <laughs> uh, somebody uh, in the earlier days um, Microsoft several Microsoft websites use web trends analytics and one of the reps from web trends said the interesting thing about a B testing was they always tried to guess who the winner was and he said we were right about 50% of the time but we never knew when we were going to be right. He said the testing just threw incredible curves at them. And they found simple little things like buttons don't resonate with people, just regular text, um, text links do far, far better. As you go along, you find the test that you just talked about was excellent. And you find that intriguing headlines, sometimes headlines or titles with a question mark seem to do well. Um, it's, the, it's the only way to do it. And um, I kudos to you because not too many, uh, not too many people have that um, discipline to go ahead and do the testing. You also have a pretty good subscriber list there to do it so yeah uh, so that really helps whereas a lot of our clients only have about three four hundred in it yeah. so therefore the testing has less impact thank you so bob nitrio let's talk 40 that and this week what what i want to talk about uh, separate from next week but but for this week what i want to talk about is the tenure of being a Fortinet partner, how, how you got from time period zero to today. And I believe it's, is it 10 years or it's, it's quite a long time that you've engaged with Fortinet. So sir, Indeed. let's play a game of what, what is your story with Fortinet? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I'm going to mask the vendor that I'm going to talk about first, which is not Fortinet. But um, many years ago, when I started doing uh, the computer networking for clients and realized that firewalls now were going to become a very essential part of the combination of equipment that we were going to be installing, I decided that I had looked at the landscape and had found the ideal partner. 
So I became partners with them, and on my very first installation, being absolutely new with their product, I needed some tech support. And when I called them, they were so condescending, they treated me like an idiot. They, and, and this is Vendor X. This is Vendor ven, X, not Porting X. Vendor, no, Vendor <laughs> X, that's correct. Okay, <clears> or Vendor right. S, could be Vendor S. And um, <laughs> so, so um, I took great offense at that, and um, I monitored the performance of that firewall for a while and decided when I needed to do my second installation that they weren't going to get my business because they treated me so so rudely. So I then went out and searched the landscape again, and um, Fortinet kept coming up at the very top of the stack. And I realized that they had a more robust and complex ecosystem than most of the competitors once they started digging into it. I can't tell you, Harry, how much I've seen this company grown over the years that I've worked with them. But quite honestly, um, from the very first installation to the last one I did, if I ever needed any tech support from them, they were available 24-7. They were collegial. They didn't talk down to a partner just because a partner picked up a new AP um, for the first time, an access point, and hadn't really studied the entire cookbook yet because it was kind of like an emergency installation. They said, no, we're going to get you through this, and we're going to teach you how to do this, and you're going to be fine. They are a great company to partner with in terms of support, but also in terms of their products. And one of the things yep. that drew me to, uh, to uh, Fortinet was the fact that they incorporated unified threat management. Now, there's a lot of people in our space that are very happy using other products that are just plain firewalls. But early on, I understood the value of having layered security and having a unified threat management product baked into that firewall made a big difference in my mind to what I could deliver to my clients. So consequently, I have been a very strong proponent of Fortinet products. And as I mentioned at the beginning, I think at the um, at the event that we went to at their headquarters, which was a phenomenal event, and it was really great to see their headquarters, um, they they seem to indicate that they feel feel that they haven't penetrated the SMB space adequately, and I Correct. agree because some of the things that I've heard from my peers at conferences and elsewhere is that oh they're too expensive. Well, uh, it it's like anything else. It depends on what you're buying. You don't ever want to overbuy for the client that you're specifying the product for, but at the same time, you certainly don't want to rely on tools that are inexpensively uh, priced or free, even in some cases. Uh, if you aren't going to be able to provide the security that the client needs, if you think you're only doing them a favor by keeping the cost of the project low, I break it down in different ways when I explain it to clients that might have a little bit of a question about the price. But when we get through it and they understand the total value of what's being brought to the table as compared to alternatives, they understand and they say, that's what I want. I've never had a hardware failure with Fortinet in all the years that I've dealt with them. And it's just been a phenomenal relationship. And now that they are making a bigger push to re-engage with the SMB space and the providers that work in that area, I think people are going to find that they have a tremendous product and they're going to learn to love them. Yep. Well, thank you, sir. And maybe next week we'll dig a little bit deeper into some of the, uh, the, the, the specific, some of the technical conversations and so on. But love the partner-to-partner -partner conversation that you're bringing to the table. Folks, if you join us late, 40 net. Think of us as all things considered on national public radio, and it's because of the generous support of underwriters that were on the air, and that's how we go to market. And so Fortinet got the memo, and they want to support uh, academic and, and, and real content-based webinars. But, you know, at, at the same time, folks, we all know how the game is played, and if you can give them a fair look, a second, a second look, we appreciate it. Um, and, Bob, don't hesitate to to perk up as we go through some of these topics if, if these are of interest to you. Um, I'm being a sponge. Okay. Okay. That's fair enough. So, 
uh, Mary, next week. And, yeah, Mary, Jenny. Do you want to run a poll really quick, or you want to move on and then come yeah, back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, Jenny, go ahead. Can you take control of that? or? Do... Yep, I got it. So our poll okay. for today is, do you offer security services as pro pro and products as a significant part of your business? Yes or no? All right, and folks, while you're answering that, just again, a shout out next week is our, our uh, lecture, our winter quarter lecture next week with Mike Simmel is on HIPAA and some other topics Friday, Friday the 2nd. So what a way to, what a way to kick off Super Bowl weekend. That will be at noon Pacific. Ginny, would you like to read the results? Uh, give it just a second more, Harry. We've still got a few more votes coming in. Oh, quickly. we do. Here. Okay. All righty. Give it a second more here. Yeah, no problem. We do have some security lectures coming up uh, as well this quarter. Being it's the year of security, if you will. All right. Do you offer security services and products as a significant part of your business? 75% of people said yes, and 25% said no. There we go. All right, Jenny, am I on screen or do I need to take back? You take are back on screen control. and ready to go. All right, let me get back to where I was, folks. And there we go. Good sweep. Um, boy, the stories I could tell. With uh, Tim O'Reilly of O'Reilly Publishing about 12 years ago held a hoot sweep one day in New York City. I flew out for it. He, he, it was actually him up on stage. I, I'm sorry, he held a Twitter kind of rewind. He held a Twitter conference about a dozen years ago. And uh, it was him, and, and and that's a pretty famous guy in our industry uh, from the publishing side. And they had one sponsor and one sponsor alone, and it appeared that the firm had gone to Kinko's that morning to print out some banners, and it was Hootsuite. And, and you know, I didn't think a whole lot about it. You know, is Twitter going to make it? Is it going to be a – ongoing concern and and so fast forward the movie to today and Hootsuite has really changed. I like to think of it as a single pane of glass for the management of a lot of applications in addition to Twitter um, and, and, and I'd recommend that you put this in your, your toolkit and for a couple of reasons. One is I just like the timer. Jenny and I use the timer to load up tweets and Facebook entries and, and that is a beautiful thing to just sit down for half a day and be focused for the next campaign and it's locked and loaded. Um, I've always felt that Twitter was, you know, like a print ad. It made the advertiser feel good. Does Twitter really do anything? Uh, you know, and I, I was kind of going around and going, nah, not really. I mean, it makes me feel good that I'm tweeting. But John, sir, you corrected me a few weeks ago that Twitter has relevancy. And, and again, in the context of Hootsuite to manage Twitter, but would, would you mind repeating that conversation that tweets actually have an SEO property? Yes, they, it is actually the same benefit as you get from LinkedIn. So when Google or Bing see a tweet go up, that references a certain page, um, they may actually reward that page with higher rankings. So in our world, it is absolutely critical. Uh, some people get a little bit disappointed that uh, they don't have huge followings on Twitter, maybe even LinkedIn. But once they start to get a couple of retweets and so on, that that is hugely important. So that is a very large part of our toolbox. Very cool. And and sir, you educated me because I just thought it was it, it was kind of fun. It's kind of fun to tweet. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Let's let's not go down the Twitter rabbit hole. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> okay, folks. 
uh, I'm going to take a left turn on our conversation and talk about predictive versus behavioral analytics. And, and John, again, love your feedback as I kind of plow through this. So the big data startup I was in is essentially pictured here in the graphic. The company is called Lead Scores. They're still alive and kicking. They're my friends. I had a holiday drink with them. Um, but go, go, go ahead and check it out. But what we did for enterprise clients is we worked with the agencies over on the left, like ad agencies. Uh, think of Wagner Edstrom or Walker Sands or some of the, the other well-known PR and ad agencies. And they would run campaigns. So they're going to fly a Cessna with a banner over a football game. And maybe the banner has a URL. And we're going to call that a campaign. And you're going to, from the stadium, click over on your phone to the URL and fill out a form. Because, hey, that's interesting. And so you do that. And that form would hit the center box. That was our process, is that we had an algorithm for the client based on a map that would score the lead. And equally important, I mean, we always want to know the highly scored leads, but when, when you get into this world, equally important is the low scored leads. And that's where we get into the world of predictive, right? Like what are the predictive qualities of an mm -hmm. individual? And things like um, having a job, there's a high correlation <laughs> between being a, a, a consumer of something, buying a home, and having a job. And, and again, that's common sense. But for the sake of today, it's, it's, it's a simple math example we can understand. Um, and, and that was predictive in nature, and typically on the front end, as we acquire the lead, and we're trying to score it and, and have a sense of um, the likelihood of that lead to convert to, for example, an on, online MBA program. Behavioral, I always viewed as downstream. And so behavioral is after we got you to come over and fill out the form and go to the website and poke around, I viewed behavioral as more of a HubSpot or Marketo or Eloqua type function of you spent three minutes on this page. You downloaded the white paper. You did this. You did that. And, and John, I would offer you need both. And I think you were, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, but I'm going to say with the small business support side at Microsoft, were you more engaged in sort of behavioral analytics, like you were interested someone read this article and read page two? Yes. Uh, yeah. It was totally in that realm. And when I worked on that particular website, we didn't really have the predictive analytics part um, available to us, but I could see where that would be hugely important. And um, on websites like that, it's kind of funny, but traffic is almost a bad thing because that means that people are having problems. But more and more as time has gone on, um, I, I know that they're using more of this, that every time there is a product launch, um, then they start to anticipate how many calls are they going to get, how many um, website searches can they expect, and what type of content might they need to handle the problems that could come up. Yep, yep, yep. Um, Folks, if you want to, another shout out to a Seattle based firm is uh, Kitterman. Uh, they're actually a big Microsoft partner active in the IAMCP. So that's a trade group of Microsoft partners. Uh, put, put it on your bucket list for 18. And they have, uh, they, they play in this area, both predictive and behavioral. And the whole idea with their solution, if you will, is, you know, to, to really get people down to mid-funnel. Now, um, let me fill out box number three on my graphics. We talked about lead generation. We talked about lead processing. Now lead conversion. Within seconds of getting that form that you filled out at a football stadium when you saw the Cessna fly over, we score it. I mean, it was, John, it felt like high-speed trading. And it kind of was because we were pushing through 10,000 leads a month. 
I mean, it was it, it was a whole different world from good old SBS. Um, yes. Um, we, and, and, and we lived in a world of speed to lead. So if you're going to go to an online college, for example, we know you're applying to potentially half a dozen online colleges almost simultaneously. You're filling out some forms. So you're going to get a phone call in a couple of minutes from our client once it hits their Salesforce instance over in the far right, lead conversion. And then they're going to nurture you. They're going to email you. They're going to call you. You could do a whole other hour on this um, and, and what that cadence looks like. If, if you want to get back at a um, – boy, this is a cruel, cruel trick, but I'm going to tell you what it is. Is if you have a, an ex-spouse where you're not getting along very well or you have a, a frenemy or better yet, an enemy, go to – um, get a quote for moving services. So just type in, you know, moving services. And there's these aggregation sites. And you're going to provide a basic little information. So you can have that ex-spouse or that ex-business partner moving from Seattle to, I don't know, I better everyone's from a lot of geographies. Maybe a, 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 a geography they're not anticipating. <laughs> Somewhere in the Midwest, a small town. Put in their mobile phone number. Hit submit, and boy, howdy, their phone is going to blow up in about three minutes. <laughs> um, you didn't hear, Jenny, can you edit that out of the recording that we're going to submit to everybody after the webinar? But if you attended the recording, that's uh, some of the analytics tricks you can play. More importantly, do it to, do it to, do it to yourself. Just go ahead. Uh, car insurance, moving services. Those are all aggregation sites and just count down and wait. One, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000. Let me know when your mobile phone blows up. I'll leave it at that. Okay, dirty little secret. <laughs> I already told you one. Let me tell you another one. Um, Simply Measured is a Seattle-based uh, analytics firm that got into social measurement early. Uh, they, they were probably ahead of their time. They're still here down the Pike Place market, good people. And so they do the likes, John, they do the likes of, uh, mm -hmm. they, they, they have some tools, and, and so Trek Bicycles would use their tools to follow not only reputation management on social media, but uh, retweets and, and activity. And Trek is going to be very interested in that as a consumer brand, and you got the team on TV, bike racing, et cetera. Perfect fit. Um, I, I went to their three-day conference uh, a year and a half ago. Um, they did not repeat it this last year. They went in a different direction with their customers. But a um, year and a half ago, I went to the conference, and it, it they kind of said the same thing where I started the presentation, saying we're 1% of the way there. They framed it up a little differently on the closing keynote on day three, and I kind of wish they had started with this on the opening keynote on day one, where loosely translated it, it amounted to uh, none of this works um, in terms of, and, 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 and don't hang up on me, folks, let me clarify, but in terms of a lot of the social stuff that you can measure the hell out of it, it's it's like the old, you know, joke and a project management certification that you can you, you can manage your project all the way to oblivion, you know, but you know exactly where <laughs> where you are. Um, and and the point is, we're still really early at this, but John, they really struggle with attribution. Yes, and, and that that's what the point was is that. So first of all, who gets the last mile click? Who gets the attribution? Who gets the credit? And it's just a mother to follow this through social and serve any insights on that, on attribution? Yeah, it, I, I think as we've discussed in the past, this is a really interesting area because when we, when we think about everybody is getting inundated. So I, I think for the longest time, people have been saying that banner ads don't work. And we've pretty well seen that ourselves that yeah, you get a lot of click through, but people don't do anything. So let's take that out of the toolbox. Um, 
We're also seeing too that people are sharing and writing about best practices and so on. And in the end, those things stop working too. I can tell you, you know, in terms of writing, it was, it was common knowledge of put an exclamation mark at every, on every headline. Well, when everybody starts <laughs> yeah. doing it, it's like, I think the one that doesn't put the exclamation mark uh, might actually have a, have a built-in advantage. So I, I think that we, we need to be entering into a new world now and really get away from trying to blast out messages uh, to people who don't want them and really start to focus on the ones who do want them and that's where hopefully this technology is going to really come into its own. Yeah, I mean, I'm fired up. If, if hopefully I'm conveying that on this webinar, but uh, boy, I owe Pat Murphy, the CEO of Lead Scores, a big, big thank you for doing what we should all be doing, and that is retraining ourselves and picking up new skill sets and so on, and getting fired up. And, 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 and John, it just it feels like the five and a quarter inch floppy, brother. <laughs> we're, we're at the beginning of this. <laughs> yes, I, I can well understand. Uh, last point on this one is attraction marketing. So a uh, friend of uh, Bob Mitrio's and mine and Jenny's is a gentleman named Scott Kiowat down in uh, essentially Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And he has led the parade and Bob feel free to speak up if you've had these talks with Scott about attraction marketing and his daily video on Facebook have, have, have you had that conversation with Scott and what he's fired up about in terms of brand building actually no I haven't um, connected with Scott for some time I do know that he moved into this marketing area but I really yep, don't yep, know yep. too much about what he's doing well, use this as a, a takeaway to call Scott. He'd love to hear Sounds from Sounds like it. <laughs> okay, so let's move into the bonus round. Um, and this is, in my opinion, the most important tool, and that is forms. And I mean to tell you, the, without talking outside of school, but the meetings I was in with the dev team, um, the, the way I was uh, typically resoundingly defeated, I felt like a minority party in the House of Representatives. I mean, I, I had some really strong opinions about forms, and I couldn't get my initiative out of committee is, is probably a nice way to put it. Um, forms are everything. Absolute, it's the conversion event for every, the world I lived in. If we don't get a form filled out, uh, John and Bob, we now go home. I mean, that's in, in my view of analytics, and I'm, you know, it's a huge field like the medical profession, and and I only worked in one specific area, but in my view of the world on analytics, man, if we don't get a form filled out, you know, we all better look for work. And and yes. there's a lot of context surrounding that, man, the, the 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 web page content, the form content, and so on. Here's what I know to be true. And then I'd like the two gentlemen just offer their sage advice in the real world is that, um, first of all, I proposed and on a regular basis uh, lost um, my assertion that we should use third-party form tools like Unbounce and Wufu. We use Unbounce. And these tools are strong, and they do a lot of things that an HTML-based form cannot do. So, for example, they're really good at... Um, attributing the geography from where the traffic came to fill out the form and that kind of thing. Because one of the things that we uh, did um, with in-form validation before we scored the lead, and these tools all do that. We actually did it manually with HTML and some APIs. But with in-form validation, one of the whole thing about lead generation and lead scoring is uh, to kick out the fraudulent Forms. And so um, with inform validation, what we would do is we would tap Twilio, which is sort of this robo-calling service, and basically they can ping a phone number. And if the phone number is disconnected or invalid, that 
that that meant the form right that we would invalidate the form because we don't want to waste staff time calling a number that's disconnected. Uh, we we to the extent we could we did address validation. Um, that's a little bit like the postal service where you run the NCOA as a process. So we, but that's what these tools do. And and there's more to forms than just filling out some fields, right? That and and oh God, I, I could go on for an hour about this. Um, and but a couple of takeaways for today: a use a program. I'm not recommending you hand code HTML forms. B, place the form on the left because we read left to right. And whenever you go to MSP sites and you go to a lot of sites, the form's on the right. And it's probably below the pay line. Put the form above the pay line on the left where the eyeball starts to read. Uh, develop AD forms. So we want to find out what forms work and what don't, of course and then progressive and responsive. So progressive, 60% um, of traffic, well, last time I checked, I haven't checked in over a year, but 60% of traffic is mobile. And so you need a progressive form that's phone friendly. So name, swipe left. Email, swipe left. Address, swipe left. That's what I would call a progressive form. And then responsive is, uh, and I'm constantly amazed. And Bob, I'm not going to name names of community vendors that I know, and I, I, I love them like brothers and sisters. But God bless them. There's some forms that are not um, that are not responsive, right? You look at it on your desktop; it's beautiful. You go to your phone, and it's not mobile friendly. And I'm like, Are you kidding me? <laughs> well, you know, Harry, you bring up a good point because um, in our research with the mobile apps as a service. We've discovered that over 65% of all internet inquiries occur on mobile devices. Yes, so sir. if you ignore that information and don't have your web your your uh, tools for mobile be responsive, you're not going to get the right kind of traffic back to the website. People aren't going to put up with a, with a mobile device that doesn't work well, that's ugly, that isn't responsive, that's just not in the cards. Uh, yeah, like the I, Saturday night. Yeah, John. Well, John, let me let me tell my little joke, and then yeah. and then I'll follow. Ha, ha, have you speak? But it's it's like that old skit on Saturday Night Live that my kids don't get the grumpy old man, where he'd say, "I'm a grumpy old man," and and Bob, well, a I am a grumpy old man, but b, <laughs> um, I have very little tolerance for mobile unfriendly sites and what I would call static forms that scroll down, but. Um, go go, uh, go, go oh, ahead. John. Yeah, what I wanted to say, Harry, is that um, Google actually has even less tolerance for mobile unfriendly sites than you do. Um, they are penalizing sites now um, that aren't mobile friendly. And that's kind of hard in our world because in dealing with B2B customers, the vast majority of traffic does come from desktop. But every year that changes. That's starting to go down all the time. Certainly B2C, um, mobile is the only game in town. I would take a slightly different tact on this. And we spent, I would say, a good part of the last three to five months working on this. We've done a lot of integration into systems such as Salesforce, Salesforce in particular. And what I've seen with a lot of small businesses is they have CRM, uh, they pay for it, they just don't use it that much. And that is something that I think every business has to really look at hard. We want all, um, all entries, all form entries from a website to go into the CRM system. Absolutely. We take it kind of even two or three steps farther. We use a lot of hidden fields. So um, one tool I did not mention was Google Tag Manager. And Tag Manager is excellent at actually putting more information in a hidden manner on a page and a form. So what we do 
is if we detect that they came from SEO, we put that into the form. The user won't see it. If they came from a campaign, which campaign? How many seconds did they spend on the website? That all goes in as hidden information, goes into Salesforce, and we want Salesforce to immediately kick out a response, thanking them and giving them some sort of expectation on what is ready to happen next. If we're um, if we have a very simple form for a download, and generally speaking, we try to put downloads behind a registration wall, but that all depends on the nature of the download. If it's just a pure brochure, that's a bad idea to put it behind registration. But even there, then we want that spitting out a response and doing a two-day response, hey, is there anything we can help you with? A 30-day response saying, this is the last email you'll get from us, but anything uh, we can help you with gladly, and here's how you can subscribe to our newsletter or do something additional. But you want the conversation to kick off with every form that gets, um, that gets inputted on your website. You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna catch what you're pitching there because in a in a different realm, I, I've actually done that this last week, uh, and it started with my Sunday newsletter. What's today? Wednesday. Um, and I did a fun poll. Uh, the 20 cities that Amazon has announced is the short list for H2. Right. And I started a fun poll, and I'm gonna blog it next week. Yada yada yada. I think I'm up to 30 30 responses. Yeah. You know, are are they going to Pittsburgh? Are they going to Austin? Everybody's got their favorite, and it's it's interesting. But but John, what I was trying to do, I guess, just practice what I preach or eat my own dog food, is just have a continual sense of engagement with the community. Um, does that poll mean anything? Not not really. But to your point, where you kind of were ending there is engagement, right? That there's a call to action or some kind of engagement. Is an outcome if, if 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 you think we're 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 telling the same story. Yes, and if you look at some of your CRM data as well as your newsletter data and so on, you can easily find that it takes two years from the time that somebody initially made contact with you, subscribe for the newsletter until they actually do formally ask for more information. Yeah. And so yeah. you never know how long it's going to take. And uh, another thing that I was going to mention is part of the work that we've been doing of late was also to integrate the CRM system with MailChimp. I like MailChimp um, just like you do. and. We want all of this stuff to happen automatically because we know that once information goes into spreadsheets and somebody has to do manual processes, great intentions, but by the end of the second week, they're going to forget. They're going to forget to do it. And also, too, if the person decides to unsubscribe in Mailchimp, that's fine. They still remain within the CRM system. That's right. And that's right. and so the two of them are somewhat disconnected, but but it it's a you just want everything to happen automatically. Yeah, yeah. That again, you know, maybe we'll pick that up summer quarter and we'll talk a little bit more about APIs, both published and APIs that are provided and or you develop. Um, that that's probably the 200 level of, of this course today. Yeah. And so we'll pick that up. Folks, I'm going to start to do a wrap, and then the next slide will be open and receptive, of course, to any questions you have, all three of us. Uh, but I, I just want to kind of do a summary. Um, we have the five cool tools plus a bonus. And I'm, I'm offering today, these are open architecture-based uh, applications, relatively cheap or free. So you got survey, you got LinkedIn, you got go to webinar, you got Mailchimp, you got Hootsuite, and then the bonuses, the forms, and again, I'm I'm suggesting Unbouncer, Woofing. Let's go to that last slide and take your questions, Jenny. 
have we done such a great job that these people are dazed and amazed and question less, or do they have some questions? Folks use the question feature in the control panel. We actually do have a few questions. The first one is, how do MSPs get E and O insurance when they offer security services? The liability is enormous, so my E and I does not cover any security services. Boy, Bob Nitrio, you're you're closer to the the real world. Any thoughts on uh, errors and emission insurance as an MSP? Um, yeah, you you always want to have insurance against those things that you are providing to your clients to the greatest extent possible. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes in these areas, it's um, very difficult to get reasonably priced insurance. My strong suggestion would be for people to contact CompTIA because they, over the years, have been ramping up activity in their legal services area, and that would be a hmm. great place to ask the question about resources for that kind of insurance. It doesn't cost anything to become a CompTIA member, and um, I would say that would be a great industry resource to start with. Fair enough, and shout out to CompTIA. They're a long, long time partner of SMB Nation. You know, Bob, it's one of those things. If I woke up every day worried about do do I compete with other communities, um, I, I, I I could drive myself crazy, and I probably wouldn't be in this line of work. If I wake up every day and say, how can I cooperate with other communities? Now we're talking to CompTIA. We've cooperated for years with them. You know, do. Yes. Do we compete for mind share? Probably. We probably do. But you know what, Bob? Not really. That's a blue ocean, buddy. <laughs> I think we're finding more and more cooperation between entities now as they realize that as markets change, they can't hit every market themselves. So it's better to work in partnership. And it's just like what we've done inside the MSP business. Uh, we always partner with people that are maybe strong in exchange uh, server management if we're not. Um, not that we do that anymore, but it was a good example of what we did do. Uh, so yep. there's opportunities to be very focused on what you do the best, but at the same time, expand your services by partnering with other people. And it's the same thing through organizations like SMB Nation, um, uh, SMB Tech Fest, CompTIA, and so forth. I mean, the more we're seeing more and more interaction between them at these events, and it's a great thing because everybody's a winner. Yeah, and and to to sign off on that conversation, my friend, that's something you would not see in pharmaceuticals. Those the, those fellows do not help each other. <laughs> <laughs> not in pharmaceuticals, no. <laughs> um, Jenny, next question, please. Yes, social media is exactly that, social, not business. Why would you go to the wrong place to get business? And then a side comment is people who run businesses are too busy to do social media. John, you want to grab that? I'll, I'll try. Um, you're definitely right that people are busy. Um, however, if they're not willing to do the social media part, I think they're going to be finding things increasingly difficult. Um, social media, especially LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn is all about people's careers and people's um, line of business. So it, it really has changed the social media playing field remarkably in the last couple of years. I have to say that even in my own personal life, I have downloaded three white papers on Facebook that were advertised that were business related, had nothing to do with my Facebook interests or outside activities. Uh, Facebook is becoming increasingly better at predicting who who is bound to like what, plus a number of websites are putting um, Google track, or I'm sorry, Facebook, as well as LinkedIn tracking on their websites so that these guys know who to remark it to. So it has changed quite a bit. It's no longer the 
sort of the Twitter era of people yelling at each other. And I'll add to that, folks, uh, uh, Google Ramon Ray, uh, and R Ramon Ray Small Business, he'll pop up out of New York. Ginny, what year did Ramon give that Be Your Own Personal Brand speech at the Microsoft Conference Center in the McKinley Room? Was that 12 or 13? It was one of our later conferences. Do you remember that? Where he, he, I believe he, it was that 13. I think it was. So, wow, five years ago, Jimmy. <laughs> um, he's still at it. And, you know, Ramon is... He, he, he's a, he, I mean, he's a, he's a real go-getter, let me tell you, New York Minute. Um, sometimes a little over the top, but take it with a grain of salt. But that would be one of my replies on the social journey is, is follow, you know, check out some of the writings of Ramon Ray about developing your own brand and everybody's a brand and yada, yada, yada. I'll leave it at that. Next well, question, Harry, could I just add one thing yeah, about yeah, about all of that a uh, real life example? So we have a client who is reselling um, some cloud software, and he is not being terribly active in social uh, LinkedIn in particular. His largest competitor is. If you go to his LinkedIn profile, you see that, uh, or the company's profile, they have 35 followers. You look at the competitor, the competitor has 500 or something in that nature. When you do a search on Google for a company, typically now you will see the company's listing or website will come up first, and then you will see the LinkedIn profile. And I will dare say that probably more people now might actually be going to LinkedIn or almost as many, let's put it that way. And when they see that the company has no followers, that's not a good sign. That's a tough barrier to overcome. Yeah, yeah, interesting. And Jenny? also Google will rank the site according to how many followers they see on LinkedIn, or it's believed that they do. And it's overwhelming. That's often where we end this lecture, the okay. overwhelmingness <laughs> factor. But uh, Jenny, next question, please. Do you have an inexpensive recommendation for CRM for a small MSP? Salesforce and Microsoft seem expensive for our use. Uh, can I answer that one? Yeah, Harry? yeah. Well, I, and Bob, I'll yeah, look I, for your advice too. Go ahead, Chop. I believe that Soho is a good one to look at, and I believe that uh, for what is it under five licenses or something like that, it's free. Um, it integrates with websites very nicely. It's not definitely not as slick as let's say Salesforce. Um, but I believe that it would get the job done. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, my my free advice is there's there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of the CRMs um, out there. Friend of the family, just a shout out to Slinger.io. So that's Grace Schroeder, a longtime SMB Nation good citizen of the community. So she's got a CRM system based on Slack. So they're basically using Slack as a platform and through a series of APIs and integrations um, ha have a CRM solution. So Slinger, S-I-L-N-G-R. There's no E at the end. So Slinger without the E.io. Bob, PSAs, uh, CRMs, and you, and you, God, we're you using Peach or Apricot for the user groups or something. Sir, what we is used, your story uh, in this area? Yeah, we used Wild Apricot to run the uh, tech group here in Sacramento. And um, it was more than adequate for our needs. In fact, it actually had a lot of features that the uh, members didn't even want to use. Um, but for CRM, um, also I've been using uh, Results CRM from our friend. Oh, yeah. Back yeah, in the Virginia. Theme. The theme, <laughs> so, yes. The yeah. theme sob and uh, that Fair enough. 
that's a very good one also for uh, people that want to have probably more than what Zoho offers, but don't need to get all the way up into the Salesforce realm. Very affordable, very powerful, uh, built from the ground up with the user in mind. Uh, results CRM would be a good one to check out. Um, Boy, howdy. He, Bob, he goes back to the, some of the early, early SMB Nation fall comp. Absolutely. Real, oh, yeah, real good citizen. Uh, Nassim Saab. Go ahead, Bob. Um, and with uh, social media, I think the, the hardest thing is that people believe that they have to have a constant conversation and be monitoring the, the traffic on these different types of websites for social media. Um, I tell people, if you need to get a hold of me, you can call me on my office line, you can leave a voicemail message, or you can send me an email. But if you expect me to monitor tweets and Facebook pages and messengers and things like this, there's only so many hours in the day to monitor the traffic that's coming to me. I will work with the social media tools, but don't expect that to become the main way to communicate with me in terms of you Fair have enough. a question, I, I need to give you an answer. That's not the right medium. So I think for those people that say, well, you see social media out there and it's going to be very time consuming. Yes, it can be time consuming, but if you don't have a presence with the social media tools that other people are using to engage with your competitor, then you will, of course, be losing business. Yep, yep, yep. Jenny, next question. That's all the questions we currently have. Okie dokie. Well, that works out well because we're, we're kind of coming towards the end of our allotted time today and lecture, as it were. So, uh, folks, appreciate you taking time out of your day next Friday. February 2nd at noon is the next MSP Tech Talk winter quarter lecture, primarily on HIPAA. Um, some other topics wrapped around it. Totally appreciate you attending today. You're going to get a thank you note with the link to the replay of this. You get the slide deck. Happy to kick that out to you. And appreciate your support as well as the support of Fortinet that makes this all possible. And, and last and not least would be the, the two panelists that we had today. So, Bob and John, thank you for once again taking time out of your day. John, we're going to have a side conversation about maybe let's let's do the 200-level lecture summer quarter sure. and, and take it to the next level for people that want to engage in a little bit of brain damage. Um, <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bob, one last question for you before I give the sign-off. So, sir, are you in Phoenix? today or are you still in Sacramento I think have, have you moved or are you in transition yeah no we're still in Sacramento we're going to be closing on the uh, new home next month and then um, and we're doing it bass backwards we uh, we're buying the house and then we're going to put ours up for sale so um, it may be March or <laughs> yeah, I know it's just I want to hit a little better market here in the springtime so it's yeah. worth it to me to uh, do it that way and um, we'll probably be moving in March or April and setting up new intergalactic headquarters there in in Phoenix, right up against the southwest corner of Scottsdale. Wow. Well, keep keep the light on. I'll come after the heat leaves, but keep the light on, and uh, we'll, we'll see you literally on the flip side. <laughs> but, but the rates are so much better during the summer, Harry. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, folks. Have a great day. We'll see you next week. Jenny, thanks as always in the radio control room. Bye-bye. Thank you.